Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Namo tasse bhagavato arahato Samma sambuddhasse Namo tasse bhagavato arahato Samma sambuddhasse Namo tasse bhagavato arahato Samma sambuddhasse Homage to the Blessed One, the Worthy One, the Supremely Enlightened One. Homage to the Blessed One, the Worthy One, the Supremely Enlightened One. Homage to the Blessed One, the Worthy One, the Supremely Enlightened One, Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Namo Buddhaya. Pay homage to my teacher, Lokasomi Mahangsa. Sadhu, Sadhu. Sadhu. So today we have this opportunity to listen to a, an excellent discourse from the Supreme Buddha where he teaches us about doing this, this sort of examination. So this sutta is called the Anangana Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya. So Anangana, what's the name of the sutta? Anangana. This means without blemishes without blemishes. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati, in Jeta's Grove, Anatta Pindaka's Park. There the Venerable Sariputta addressed the bhikkhus thus. Friends, bhikkhus. Friend, they replied, the Venerable Sariputta said this. So who's giving this desana? Venerable Sariputta. And who was the Venerable Sariputta? Yeah, chief disciple of the Supreme Buddha. The Supreme Buddha said, uh, monks, you should either listen to a, a desana from me or from Venerable Sariputta. Right? So we know that we're getting really excellent dhamma. We're getting the, the Supreme Buddha's dhamma when we listen to a, a desana from the Venerable Sariputta. So, Arahant Sariputta says, Friends, there are these four kinds of persons found existing in the world. What four? Here, some person with a blemish does not understand as it actually is. I have a blemish in myself. Here, some person with a blemish understands it as it actually is. I have a blemish in myself. Here, some person with no blemish does not understand as it actually is. Thus, I have no blemish in myself. Here, some person with no blemish understands it as it actually is. Thus, I have no blemish in myself. Okay, so how many kinds of persons are there? Four kinds of persons. And the first two kinds of, of people, do they have a blemish or not? Yes. The first two kinds of people, they have a blemish. The first person, does this person know that they have a blemish? No. They, they have a blemish, but they don't know. The second kind of person, do they know? Yes. Okay, so they're a person who has a blemish, and they do know. So what's a blemish in the ordinary world? What do we mean by blemish? It's a little problem of some sort, right? Maybe uh, 
this wooden stand here. It's all very beautiful, very perfect, but on the side it has a little spot, right? A, a little chunk taken out, right? We can call that a blemish. Or maybe uh, we have a spot on our face. We call that a blemish, right? So this first kind of, these first two kinds of people, they have a blemish. They have a little problem. They have something wrong with themselves. And the first person doesn't know, and the second person does know. Then the next two kind of people, they don't have a blemish, right? But it's not, it's not that simple, because one person, they don't know that they're free from blemishes. But the second person, they know, I don't have a blemish. They're aware of that. They're aware of that fact. So which do you think is, is the better kind of person? Is it better to, to know that you have a blemish or to not know that you have a blemish? Yeah. Do you want to be happily ignorant, right? If you have a problem, better not, just don't know about it, right? Then you'll be happy. Does that sound like the Supreme Buddha's Dhamma? No? Okay, let's listen. Here, the person with a blemish who does not understand it as it actually is, I have a blemish in myself, is called the inferior of these two persons with a blemish. So what does inferior mean? Lower, yeah. Yeah, lower type of person. Here, the person with a blemish who understands it as it actually is thus, I have a blemish within myself, is called the superior of these two persons with a blemish. So what's superior? Higher, yeah. So even though both of these people, they have a problem, there's something wrong with them, even then there can be a distinction between these two kinds of people. So when we think of ourselves and we, we think, oh, do I have a blemish, right? We can know, are we aware of that blemish or are we, are we unaware? Then the next two kinds of people, what are, what are they like? Do they have a blemish? No. But still there's a difference between the two of them. Here, the person with no blemish, who does not understand it as it actually is thus, I have no blemish, is called the inferior of these two persons with no blemish. Herein, the person with no blemish, who understands it as it actually is thus, I have no blemish, is called the superior of these two persons with no blemish. So what's the best kind of person to be? A person with no blemish, and they know that they, that they don't have a blemish. And what's the, the lowest kind of person to be? A person who has a blemish, and doesn't know that they have it, right? They have unwholesome qualities, and they're completely ignorant of the fact that they have these unwholesome qualities. The Supreme Buddha taught us uh, that if a fool, if a foolish person knows that they're a foolish person, then just even in that little bit, they have a little bit of wisdom, right? But someone who's, who's a foolish person, and they think they're very wise, and then they're completely foolish. They're a completely foolish person. So when this was said, the Venerable Mahamukkalana asked the Venerable Sariputta, so who's listening to this, to this desana? Venerable Mahamukkalana, probably many other monks as well, but, but Venerable Mahamukkalana, he asked a question. Okay, so let's think about this. Are these ordinary people Discussing the Dhamma? No. These are great arahants, the two chief disciples, discussing the Dhamma. Right? Do they need to discuss the Dhamma to, to put an end to their round of samsara? No. No, they've already completely put an end to this round of samsara. But yet, they still sit together and talk about the Dhamma. So, what about us? Right? If we haven't put an end to this round of samsara, then absolutely we must sit together and listen to the Dhamma, right? If even the arahants enjoy sitting together, listening to the Supreme Dhamma, 
then we should really pay very close attention. So when this was said, the Venerable Maha Mukkalana asked the Venerable Sariputta, Friend Sariputta, what is the cause and what is the reason why of these two persons with a blemish? One is called the inferior and the other is called the superior. What is the cause and reason why of these two persons with no blemish? One is called the inferior and one is called the superior. So he asks for an explanation why one is called lower and one is called higher. Then the Venerable Sariputta says, Here, friend, when a person with a blemish does not understand it as it actually is thus, I have a blemish in myself. It can be expected that he will not arouse zeal, make effort, or instigate energy to abandon that blemish, and that he will die with lust, hatred, and delusion, with a blemish, with mind defiled. So here's someone, they have an unwholesome quality. They, maybe they have a lot of anger, but they don't realize how angry they are. If they don't realize how angry they are, are they going to try and learn how to overcome this anger? No, they just think it's a normal thing. Maybe they even think that this, this anger is a good thing, that it helps them, right? It helps them uh, get a better job, it helps them win debates, right? Maybe someone thinks that, that these unwholesome qualities are actually a good, a good thing. Are they gonna try and overcome that anger? No. So he will not arouse zeal. What does this mean, arouse zeal? That we get excited to overcome these unwholesome qualities. He won't, he won't get excited to overcome them. Won't make an effort, won't stir up energy uh, to abandon whatever unwholesome qualities they are. Right, if we, have, if we have something on our face and we don't know that it's there, are we gonna try and, and wipe it off? No, we can't tell, we can't, we can't see it. So we just walk around with, with something on our face, right? Then Venerable Sariputta gives us a simile. He says, suppose a bronze dish were brought from a shop or a smithy covered with dirt and stains. So someone gets, what do they get? They get a bronze dish, right? A dish. And is it clean or is it dirty? It's dirty. And the owners neither used it nor had it cleaned but put it away in a dusty corner. So they get this dirty dish. Are they happy about it? No. They just leave it dirty. And where do they put it? Yeah. In a corner somewhere. In a dirty corner somewhere. Maybe behind some furniture. Right? So would that bronze dish thus get more defiled and stained later on? So if, it's, if it starts out dirty, and you put it in a dirty place, is it gonna get clean? No, absolutely not. It's just gonna get more dirty. So too, friend, when a person with a blemish does not understand as it actually is thus, I have a blemish in myself, it can be expected that he will not arouse zeal, make effort, or instigate energy to abandon that blemish, and that he will die with lust hate and delusion. So does someone overcome their, their greediness just by getting older? No. Do they overcome their hatred just by living their life in an ordinary way? No. If they don't, if they don't know that they have these unwholesome qualities, they won't make the effort. Our unwholesome qualities don't just magically wear away. You know, like our hair turns gray sort of naturally as we get older. We don't become wise naturally as we get older. We don't develop wholesome qualities naturally. So this is the first, the first type of person. The second type of person. Here, when a person with a blemish understands it as it actually is thus, I have a blemish in myself, it can be expected that he will arouse zeal, 
make effort and instigate energy to abandon that blemish and that he will die without lust, hate and delusion, without blemish, with mind undefiled. So if someone tells us, mm, you have some food on your face, right? what do we do? We wipe it off right away. We don't argue with them and say, you don't know what you're talking about. That's not food, that's, you know, no. When someone tells us that, we, we wipe it off right away, right? When we, once we know that there's, there's something on our face, just automatically our, our hand comes out quickly and we, and we wipe it away, right? So it can be the same with, with unwholesome qualities. When we, when we realize, oh, you know, I'm a really greedy person. I do terrible things because of my greed, right? Then we think, oh, this is a bad thing. This is like a, a stain on me. This is a blemish. How can I overcome this, this greed? And then when we listen to the, the teachings of the Supreme Buddha and he talks about greed, then we, we pay very close attention. We try and, and learn how we can overcome this greed. So this is the, the second type of person. And here's the simile. Arahant Sariputta says, suppose a bronze dish were brought from a shop or a smithy covered with dirt and stains, and the owner used it and had it cleaned and did not put it in a dusty corner. Would that bronze dish thus get cleaner and brighter later on? So someone gives you a dish and it's filthy, right? But instead of just hiding it somewhere, you clean it and you use it and you keep it in a, in a safe place. You put it in a, in a cupboard, uh, maybe with a glass door, and you keep, it, you keep it very clean. So would that bronze dish get cleaner and brighter later on? Yes. So too, friend, when a person with a blemish understands it as it actually is thus, I have a blemish in myself, it can be expected that he will arouse zeal, make effort, and instigate energy to abandon that blemish, and that he will die without lust, without hate and delusion without blemish, with a mind undefiled. So we have this chance. If we can learn what, what our unwholesome qualities are, we have this chance to overcome them right, before, we, before we die from this life. So this is the second, that was the second type of person. The third type of person, herein when a person with no blemish does not understand as it actually is thus, I have no blemish in myself. Okay, remember there's, for people who don't have a blemish, there's still, there's still a distinction. So what's the problem if someone doesn't have a blemish and they don't realize it? Let's listen. It can be expected that he will give attention to the sign of the beautiful, that by his doing so, lust will infect his mind and that he will die with lust, hate and delusion, with a blemish with mind defiled. So this person who doesn't have a blemish, and we're talking about sort of ordinary unwholesome qualities, right? They don't have lust in their mind. They don't have strong lust arising. They don't have strong uh, ill will arising, hatred, cruelty. But they don't realize that these unwholesome qualities aren't, uh, aren't active in their mind. They don't appreciate that they can arise later, that they haven't completely overcome them. So this person, they give attention to the sign of the beautiful. They look at beautiful objects, listen to beautiful sounds, right? Eat, eat delicious tastes, excellent smells, right? So when they do that, what happens? When they do it unmindfully, lust arises. Before they didn't have lust, but then because they weren't careful, they didn't know what to pay attention to, what not to pay attention to, then lust arises and their mind becomes more defiled. So even though they started out without these unwholesome qualities, they developed because they weren't aware that they didn't have them in the first place. Suppose a bronze dish were brought from a shop or a smithy, clean and bright, and the owner neither used it nor had it cleaned but put it in a dusty corner. Would that bronze dish 
thus get more defiled and more stained later on? What do you think? Even though it came clean, it came from the, the store brand new, shiny clean, but they put it you know, behind the couch, behind, in the back of a closet. Is it gonna get, is it gonna stay clean? No. It will get uh, more defiled, more stained later on. So too, friend, when a person with no blemish does not understand it as it actually is thus, I have no blemish in myself. It can be expected that he will die with lust, hate, and delusion, with a blemish, with a mind defiled. So even if we don't have a lot of uh, very strong hatred, very strong greed, right? We still need to be aware this is a, this is a potential in our mind. This can arise. If we pay attention to the wrong thing, unwholesome qualities can arise. So the fourth person, when a person with no blemish understands it as it actually is thus, I have no blemish in myself. It can be expected that he will not give attention to the sign of the beautiful, that by his not doing so, lust will not infect his mind, and that he will die without lust, hate, and delusion, without blemish, with a mind undefiled. So this person, they don't have a lot of strong greed, but they know, you know, there's a reason that I don't have strong greed. It's because I don't pay attention to, to sensual pleasures. Right? They understand the danger in, in focusing too much on sensual pleasures, so they know to stay away from that. Suppose a bronze dish were brought from a shop or a smithy clean and bright, and the owners used it and had it cleaned and did not put it in a dusty corner. Would that bronze dish thus get cleaner and brighter later on? So it came clean and they used it all the time and they put it in a safe place. Does it, does it maintain that cleanliness? Does it stay clean? Yes. So too, friend, when a person with no blemish understands it as it actually is thus, I have no blemish in myself. It can be expected that he will die with a mind undefiled. Right? So when we examine our mind and we see, you know, I have, I have this hatred in my mind. We know we have a blemish. We can overcome that. When we examine our mind and we see, you know, I'm not, I'm not really greedy for sensual pleasures. But, and we know that. We realize that. And we, we know with wisdom but I don't want to keep, I don't want to start paying attention to sensual pleasures, right? I don't, I don't think, oh, well, I'm immune, right? I can enjoy sensual pleasures and not get attached to them, right? A wise person knows that's not true. They know that, that it's a potential blemish waiting there to happen. So the Venerable Sariputta says, this is the cause and reason why of these two persons with a blemish one is called the inferior, and one is called the superior. This is the cause and reason why of these two persons with no blemish, one is called the inferior, and one is called the superior. Blemish is said, friend, but what is this word blemish a term for? So here we've been talking about blemishes, and now the Venerable Sariputta will tell us in, in detail exactly what he means by this term blemish. Blemish, friend, is a term for the spheres of evil, unwholesome wishes. So what's a blemish? It's a term for the spheres of evil, unwholesome wishes. Okay. So now we're going to hear about those, those unwholesome wishes. And who's he having this conversation with? Varma Mahamukkalana. It is possible that a bhikkhu here might wish, if I commit an offense, let the bhikkhus not know that I have committed an offense. So what's the wish? If I've committed an offense, does he want the other bhikkhus to know about it? No, he wants to keep it a secret. Okay, does that sound like a wholesome wish or an unwholesome wish? 
unwholesome wish. Because we learned what happens when we try and hide our bad qualities. When we hide our bad qualities, do they, do they increase or decrease? Yeah, they certainly don't decrease. They're going to increase. So he has this wish. If I do something wrong, I don't want anybody to know. I want it to be a secret. So what are some of the things that, that a monk might do wrong? Maybe he, uh, he takes money, he steals something, right? He eats, he sneaks into the kitchen at night and, and eats a little bit of food, right? And he has the wish, oh, I don't want anybody to know, right? It'll be a secret. If nobody knows, then it's not a problem, right? Wholesome wish or unwholesome wish? Very unwholesome wish, okay? But then what happens? It's possible that the bhikkhus come to know that that bhikkhu has committed an offense, so they find out. They see the, the crumbs in his kuti of the snack that he ate, right? right? Or they see that he, he has money in his bag. They pick up his, his shoulder bag and they hear jingle, 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 right? They hear, they hear some, some money in there and he gets caught, right? And then do you think he's happy? He says, oh, well, you were going to find out anyway. It's good that you find... Does he think that? No, he gets very angry. So he's angry and bitter thus. The bhikkhus know I have committed an offense. So he gets very angry, right? He wanted to hide it, but they found out. The anger and the bitterness are both a blemish. So this, this is the blemish. When he gets angry and bitter... Right? He gets mad at those bhikkhus. So who did something wrong? Did he do something wrong or did the bhikkhus do something wrong? He did something wrong. And is he angry at himself? No. He's angry at those bhikkhus, right? He thinks it's their problem, right? Wholesome or unwholesome? Unwholesome, very unwholesome. And that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning. It's possible that a bhikkhu here might wish I have committed an offense. The bhikkhus should admonish me in private, not in the midst of a sangha. So he knows he's done something wrong, and he knows he's going to get caught. But he has this wish, I hope they do it when I'm alone, right? Not in front of everybody else. There's no need to involve everybody. It's just me. You know, we can do this privately. We can take care of this quietly, off to the side, right? That's his wish, okay? He knows he's going to get caught, but, but at least let them, you know, talk to me privately, respectfully, right? But then what happens? He's in the big group of monks, and they say, what is it that you did? You know, how could you have done that? They say, this isn't good, and he gets angry. Right? Because he wanted to be admonished privately. But instead, he gets, ang he gets admonished in front of the entire Sangha. So he gets bitter and angry. And this anger and this bitterness is a blemish. It's possible that a bhikkhu here might wish, I have committed an offense. A person who is my equal should admonish me not a person who is not my equal. Right? So where's the problem? The problem starts with him doing bad things, right? He shouldn't be doing those bad things in the first place. But he's putting all these conditions, saying, well, you know, I don't want to get caught. Or if I do get caught, they should tell me, you know, privately, don't embarrass me in front of everyone. And then he thinks, you know, only, only someone my equal, or maybe a senior monk, they can talk to me. But I don't want a junior monk to tell me that I've done something wrong. Right? He's very proud, very arrogant. But then what happens? It's a junior monk that catches him, you know, in the kitchen. He says, Pante, what are you doing in the kitchen? You shouldn't be here now. Right? And then he gets angry and bitter. So the Supreme Buddha, he taught us that this that this association with Kalyanamitta is so important, right? Because we need the help of our Kalyanamittas to, to learn 
when we do bad things. Maybe we don't even realize that, that we've broken a precept. But our Kalyanamittas, they explain to us, you know, friend, you should know, it, did you do this? Did you do that? Okay, that's, that's an offense. The Supreme Buddha has declared that's an offense. And then through this system, we can improve ourselves. We can remove our blemishes, right? Maybe we didn't know that something was an offense, something was dangerous. So because we have these Kalyanamittas, and because they show us what's right and what's wrong, then we can remove our blemishes. It's an excellent system. And uh, part of what's excellent about it is that, uh, that it's not restricted to just the senior monks correcting the junior monks, right? It's a team effort. Everyone works together, that we lift each other up through, uh, through teaching each other in this way. So maybe you remember the story of Venerable Sariputta going on alms round into the city, and there was a junior monk, a novice monk, walking behind him. And this novice monk noticed that the Venerable Sariputta's robe had slipped down. It was crooked. And so the junior monk goes to him and says, Bhante, Venerable Sir, uh, your robe has, has slipped down. Our robe is supposed to be, to be even across. Venerable Sariputta says, Sadhu, 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 thank you you know, for telling me that. I can correct myself. So here, Venerable Sariputta, chief disciple of the Supreme Buddha, second only to the Supreme Buddha, being able to expound the Dhamma, he takes this, this correction so peacefully, so happily. This is how we, how we develop our wholesome qualities. But this monk here, does he say sadhu sadhu when, when someone corrects him? No, he gets angry and he gets bitter, and this is a blemish. It's possible that a bhikkhu here might wish, oh, that the teacher might teach the Dhamma to the bhikkhus by asking a series of questions of me, not of some other bhikkhu. So we know how the Supreme Buddha teaches the Dhamma. He says, uh, monks, is, is form permanent or impermanent? And the monk answers, impermanent, Venerable Sir. Right? Is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering, Venerable Sir. So we know this is the excellent way that the Supreme Buddha teaches the Dhamma. So instead of this monk thinking, you know, I have this chance to listen to the Dhamma from the Supreme Buddha together with my, my companions in the holy life, instead of thinking that, what does he think? He thinks, ooh, I hope he calls on me, right? I hope that, that I get to be the one to, to answer the questions, right? Is this a wholesome wish or an unwholesome wish? Unwholesome wish, because what happens? The Supreme Buddha calls on somebody else. He teaches the Dhamma by asking questions to another monk. And then this, this monk is angry and bitter, thinking, oh, I wanted him to ask me questions. Why didn't he ask me questions? What a foolish monk this is. Right? Instead of listening to the Dhamma, all he's thinking about is, is showing off in the middle of the Sangha. So this, is a, this anger is a, is a blemish. It's possible that a bhikkhu here might wish, oh, that the bhikkhus might enter the village for alms, putting me in the forefront, not some other bhikkhu. So, when the monks go into to town in the morning, when they go together in a group, they usually walk in a, in a nice line. So this monk thinks, oh, I want to be first. I want to be the first one in line. So when people in the town see the monks coming, they see, you know, they see my face first, right? Wholesome wish, unwholesome wish, unwholesome wish, very unwholesome wish. And what happens? somebody else goes first in line. And is he happy about it? No, he's unhappy about it. See all the ways that, that people can, can wish for unwholesome things, even in this very simple, uh, this excellent brahmacharya life, how the mind can get so twisted around, how it can have so many blemishes. One day, an elephant trainer came to the Supreme Buddha and said, you know, it's amazing, Venerable Sir, when I'm, when I'm taking an elephant into town, 
between the stable and the town and back. He'll show me every trick that he has. He'll disobey me in every way that he knows how, just in that, uh, just in that short little trip. But the people that work for me, my employees, they come up with so many ways to be tricky, to be disobedient, right? Elephants are very simple, but human beings, very tricky. There's no end to the way that, that human beings can be very tricky. So see, even this, even this very simple thing of walking into, into town for alms, someone with, with unwholesome wishes, with a blemish, they can come up with a way to, to make it a terrible thing. Right? So we have to be very careful. We have to be very careful with our mind. So it's possible that a bhikkhu here might wish, oh, that I might get the best seat, the best water, the best alms food in the refectory and not some other bhikkhu. So these are very simple things that a, that a monk uses. A seat, you know, a simple seat, just water, right? The alms food, very low means of livelihood. But here, this bhikkhu has developed greed for those things. He wants only the best, right? See how tricky this mind is? It can develop, uh, it can develop attachment even to the most simple things. So what about, you know, all the sensual pleasures in the world? Think about how tricky those are. If someone can be attached just to having good water, you know, sitting on, on a good seat. So he wishes, you know, may I have a good seat, may I have good water, may I have the best alms food. And does he get those? No, he doesn't get those. And he's angry because of it. He's angry and bitter. He's mad at the monks who, who assigned seats, right, who passed out the water. And that anger and bitterness are both a blemish. So it's possible that a bhikkhu here might wish, oh, that I might give the blessing in the refectory after the meal. So the monk thinks, oh, I want to give the, the anamodana, right, after the meal. Then everyone can listen to me. But he doesn't get to. And then he gets angry. How, how foolish this person is, right? They, because if someone else is giving the anamodana, then what do they have? They have the opportunity to listen to the Dhamma, right? But instead of that, instead of thinking about this wholesome opportunity they have, they get angry. They wish that, that they were the one preaching. So it's possible that a bhikkhu might wish, oh, that I might teach the Dhamma to the bhikkhus, to the bhikkhunis, to the male lay followers, to the female lay followers, right? So this is, it's actually very wholesome to want to, to teach the Dhamma. This is the highest gift that someone can give, very wholesome. But when we don't have the chance, when someone else is chosen to preach, should we be happy or unhappy? Happy, because they have the opportunity to make merit, we have the opportunity to listen to the Dhamma, right? But this monk, someone else is chosen to preach, and he gets angry. He totally loses his opportunity. He builds up lots of demerit, develops lots of unwholesome qualities. It's possible that a bhikkhu here might wish, oh, that the bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, men lay followers, women lay followers, might honor, respect, revere, and venerate me, not some other bhikkhu. Is this a wholesome wish or an unwholesome wish? Someone wants to be praised by others. Someone wants to be venerated. Not a wholesome wish. Not beneficial. Because what happens? Someone else is, is honored, right? Someone else is praised. So he's very sad. It's possible that a bhikkhu here might wish, oh, that I might be the one to get a superior robe superior alms food, a superior resting place, superior medicinal requisites, not some other bhikkhu. Then the Venerable Sariputta says, 
If the spheres of these evil unwholesome wishes are seen and heard to be unabandoned in any bhikkhu, so if they're unabandoned, what does that mean? Does he have them or not? He has them, right? When you abandon something, you remove it, you give it away. When it's unabandoned, then you still have it. So if the spheres of these evil, unwholesome wishes are seen and heard to be unabandoned in any bhikkhu, then for all he may be a forest dweller, a frequenter of remote abodes, an alms food eater, a house-to-house -house seeker, a refuse, a refuse rag wearer, a wearer of rough robes. Still, his fellows in the holy life do not honor, respect, revere, and venerate him. Why is that? Because the spheres of these evil, unwholesome wishes are seen and heard to be unabandoned in that venerable one. Then the Venerable Sariputta gives us a simile. He says, Suppose a bronze dish were brought from a shop or a smithy, clean and bright, and the owner put the carcass of a snake or a dog or a human being in it. Okay, do we usually do that with a, a nice clean dish? No, this is something, this is something unusual puts a dead snake or a dead dog or a dead human in this dish and then covers it with another dish. And they go back to the market and people see this person with this beautiful dish and they say, what is that that you are carrying about like a treasure? So this person comes along with a beautiful dish, you know, holding it proudly. Right, walking around and people get very excited. They see something, oh, there must be something beautiful in that. It looks very nice on the outside. And then raising the lid and uncovering it, people look and what do they see? A dead dog, a dead snake, a dead person. So they looked in and as soon as they saw, they were inspired with such loathing, repugnance and disgust so they were disgusted by this, this dead snake, this dead dog, dead human. That those people who were hungry before, they lose their appetite. They're not hungry. And the people that weren't hungry to begin with, they're really not hungry, right? They're totally disgusted. They don't even want to think about eating. Venerable Sariputta says, so too. If these spheres of evil, unwholesome wishes are unabandoned in a monk, even though he walks for alms, even though he goes from house to house without choosing, even though he wears uh, rough robes, robes from the, the cemetery ground, even though he does those, those external things, because on the inside he has a, a dead snake, a dead dog, a human being, right? When you look inside, unwholesome qualities, unwholesome qualities. And his, his fellow monks won't venerate him. Then the Venerable Sariputta says, if the spheres of these evil, unwholesome wishes are seen and heard to be abandoned in any bhikkhu, then for all he may be a village dweller an acceptor of invitations, a wearer of robes given him by householders. So this monk, he lives in the city. If people invite him to come to their house for a dana, he'll go to their house for a dana. If people give him uh, very comfortable robes to wear, he'll wear them. But does he have greed for that, for that dana? Does he have attachment to those, to those robes? Does he have this wish, oh, I hope they give me good robes. I hope they give me delicious food. Does he get angry if they don't? No, because he's abandoned these unwholesome qualities. Because these spheres of evil, unwholesome wishes are seen and heard to be abandoned in that venerable one. 
So is it just monks and nuns that can be greedy for, for uncomfortable clothing? No. That can be greedy for food, delicious food? No. Can lay people be greedy for comfortable clothing too? Yeah. Yeah. So we remember that, that we're listening to instructions, how to purify our minds, right? The Supreme Buddha and his disciples gave, gave these instructions with great compassion to his monks and nuns so they would know how to purify their mind. And we, we all listen to them because we all can have these, uh, these evil, unwholesome wishes in our mind, can't we? Suppose a bronze dish were brought from a shop or a smithy, clean and bright, and the owners put clean boiled rice and various soups and sauces into it, and covering it with another dish, went back to the market. Then people seeing it said, what is that that you're carrying about, like a treasure? Then raising the lid and uncovering it, they looked in, and as soon as they saw, they were inspired with such liking, appetite, and relish, that even those who were full would want to eat, not to speak of those who were hungry. Right? So when, when people have confidence in the teaching of the Supreme Buddha, and when they see a monk who's given up this greed, this hatred, this anger, this delusion, when they see this monk, their hearts are inspired, right? Their faith increases. And those people without faith, their faith increases even more when they see that, that someone is following the instructions of a supremely enlightened Buddha. So too, friends, if the spheres of these evil, unwholesome wishes are seen and heard to be abandoned in any bhikkhu, then for all he may be a village dweller, an acceptor of invitations, a wearer of robes given by householders. Then his companion in the holy life, they honor, respect, and revere him because he's overcome these unwholesome qualities. He's removed these blemishes. When this was said, the Venerable Maha Mokkalana said to the Venerable Sariputta, a simile occurs to me, friend. Stated friend Mokkalana. So the Venerable Mokkalana has been listening, and as he's listening, he, he thinks of, a, of something that happened. This reminds him of something that happened. He says, on one occasion, friend, I was living at the hill fort at Rajagaha. Then when it was morning, I dressed and taking my bowl and outer robe, I went into Rajagaha for alms. Now on that occasion, Samiti, the Cartwright's son, was planing a fellow. So he's a, a wheel maker. That's what a Cartwright is. So this used to be a very important uh, job. It's still an important job. Right? Making wheels. If we don't have wheels, we can't go anywhere. So this person was making wheels by hand. And he was making them out of wood. That's what they used to, to make cartwheels out of. So he was, he was shaping this, this wood, uh, this, this wheel maker named Samiti. And while this was happening, the Ajivaka Panduputta, son of a former cartwright, was standing by. So there was a, an Ajivaka, a monk from another sect, who was watching this, this wheel maker make the wheel. And this, uh, this ascetic, he, his father, used to make wheels. Right? So as he was watching, he knew what was going on when this wheel was being made. Then this thought arose in the Ajivaka Panduputta's mind. So as he's watching, he thinks this thought. Oh, that this Samiti, Samiti, the Cartwright's son, might plane this bend, this twist, this fault out of the fellow, 
so that it would be without bends, twists, and faults. So a fellow is the, the outside part of the wheel. So he's thinking, okay, he should plane it this way, and he should smooth this here, and he should twist this, you know, like this. So he's, uh, he's kind of like a backseat driver, right? He's watching, and he's thinking, oh, he should do this, and he should do that, because he knows how wheels are made. So the wheel would come to consist purely of heartwood. So the wheel would be very strong. And just as this thought came to pass in his mind, so did Samiti, the Cartwright's son, plane that bend, that twist, that fault out of the fellow. So all the things that the, that the ascetic was thinking should happen to that wheel, exactly that happened to the wheel. Is that because the ascetic had psychic powers? No. Who's the one with psychic powers here? Venerable Mahamokkalana, because he can see exactly what's going on. He can see with his eyes what's going on, and he knows in this ascetic's mind that, that this is what's happening. Then the Ajivaka, Panduputta, son of the former Cartwright, was glad, and he voiced his gladness thus. He plains just as if he knew my heart with his heart. So he was very excited that, that, that this wheelmaker was doing exactly what he thought should be done. Then the Venerable Mahamukkalana says, So too, friend, there are persons who are faithless and have gone forth from the home life into homelessness, not out of faith, but seeking a livelihood. So they don't become monks and nuns because they they have confidence in the Supreme Buddha. Why do they become monks and nuns? So they can get food to eat. So they can get a place to sleep. Right? Sometimes people did that. They looked and they saw, oh, you know these monks? They eat really good food. You know, they just walk around and people put food in their bowls. That sounds like a good that sounds like a good system. I'll be part of that. Right? There were people that people that did that. There were people that did that. Is this a wholesome reason to become a monk or a nun? No, absolutely not. So this is the kind of person that, that Venerable uh, Mukalana is talking about. Gone forth from the home life into homelessness, not out of faith, but seeking a livelihood, who are fraudulent, deceitful, treacherous. So they tell lies. They're not honest. They're very tricky people. You can't trust them. Haughty, hollow, personally vain. So they're very snobby, very arrogant, hollow. They don't have, they don't have good qualities inside. They're empty, totally empty of good qualities. Rough tongue, loose spoken, unguarded in their sense faculties. So they say whatever comes to their mind. They say angry words, mean words. They don't guard their sense faculties. They look at, they look at beautiful objects without reflecting wisely. Immoderate in eating, undevoted to wakefulness, unconcerned with recluseship. They're not really, they're not really following the monk's life, the nun's life. They're not concerned with abandoning. They're concerned with, with getting more things. Not greatly respectful of training. Luxurious, careless. Leaders in backsliding. So remember, we talked about a standstill. Are these monks standing still? No, they're backsliding. They're going backwards. They're not even standing still. They're going backwards. They're developing more and more unwholesome qualities. And not only that, but they're leaders in backsliding, right? They encourage others. Come with me. You know, let's do these bad things. It'll be fun, right? That's, that's this first type of monk. Neglectful of seclusion. Lazy, wanting in energy. Unmindful, not fully aware unconcentrated, with straying minds, devoid of wisdom, drivelers. So just very foolish people. That there are some people who become monks and nuns who are like this. 
The Venerable Sariputta, with his discourse on the Dhamma, planes out their faults just as if he knew my heart with his heart. So this is the simile that came to the Venerable Mahamogalana. He says, just in the same way that this, uh, this ascetic who was watching the Cartwright son make this wheel, planing out all the faults, all the imperfections, in the same way Venerable Sariputta was helping these, these bad monks, these monks with the evil wishes, remove their, their unwholesome qualities. So sometimes a, a teacher might uh, be afraid of people finding out that, that his students have unwholesome qualities, right? So all he does is praise his students. My students are excellent, right? My students are the best. They're better than your students, right? Are those students going to improve if they have unwholesome qualities? No. This is the great compassion that, that Venerable Sariputta had. He didn't, just, he didn't just praise, he didn't just brag about, about the students there. He pointed out, you know, bit by bit, all these unwholesome qualities out of compassion so they could know that they had a blemish. Because we remember, if we know that we have a blemish, will we, will we remove that blemish? Is there a chance that we might remove it? Yeah. So this is why the, the Venerable Sariputta talks about these things. But there are clansmen who have gone forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness, who are not fraudulent, deceitful, treacherous. So this is a different kind of monk. They're not haughty. They're not hollow. They're not personally vain, rough-tongued, or loose-spoken. They're guarded in their sense faculties, moderate in eating, devoted to wakefulness, concerned with recluseship, concerned about seclusion, concerned about uh, renouncing sensual pleasures. Greatly respectful of training, not luxurious or careless, who are keen to avoid backsliding, so they don't want to go backwards. They only want to go forwards in developing wholesome qualities. Leaders in seclusion, they set the example. They show the benefits of, of living apart from society. Energetic, resolute, established in mindfulness, fully aware, concentrated, with unified minds, possessing wisdom, not drivelers. So this is the second kind of the second kind of monk. These, on hearing the Venerable Saudi put his discourse on the Dhamma, drink it in and eat it, as it were, by word and thought. So when they hear this Dhamma being preached, do they get angry hearing about these, these unwholesome qualities? No. They take it in. They think, oh, how fortunate I am to have this opportunity, this very rare opportunity to listen to the Dhamma, to have someone point out what my faults are, what the potential faults are in my mind. They drink it in and eat it, as it were, by word and thought. Good indeed is it that he makes his fellows in the holy life emerge from the unwholesome and establish themselves in the wholesome. Because remember, even someone who doesn't have a blemish, they still need to remember, they still need to know, you know, I don't have a blemish in me. Why is that? Because if they don't know that, they'll pay attention to the wrong things. They'll pay attention to the sign of the beautiful and lust will arise. So they have to know, even if they don't have very strong unwholesome qualities, they have to know these are the dangers waiting out there for us. Just as a woman or a man, young, youthful, fond of adornments, with head bathed, having received a garland of lotuses, jasmine, or roses, would take it with both hands and place it on the head. So imagine uh, a young person 
who likes to be, who likes to dress up. Right? They like beautiful clothes. Um, they like to look beautiful. So they've just taken a bath. They've gotten clean. And someone gives them uh, a garland of flowers, jasmine flowers. Right? It's the perfect thing to complete their, their ensemble, their wardrobe. Right? Do they, do they throw it away? Are they unhappy to get that? No. Ah, oh, thank you. They take it with both hands and they and they put it on their head. They know that that they've cleaned themselves up and now they get something even more beautiful. Right? In the same way, these these monks who don't have these unwholesome qualities, who are developing wholesome qualities, when they hear the dhamma, they take it and they wear it like something very beautiful. They're very excited to get it. So these monks, on hearing the Venerable Sariputta's discourse on the Dhamma, drink it in and eat it, as it were, by word and thought. Good indeed is it that he makes his fellows in the holy life emerge from the unwholesome and establish themselves in the wholesome. Thus it was that these two great beings rejoiced in each other's good words. Sad, sad. Sound